Hi. Um, good afternoon. So good afternoon, and I'm going to be a lecturer for today. And And today we're going to look into um, leading change in the of social care. And the learning outcomes is to for the learner to understand the perspectives of quality in health and social care services. We'll discuss more into the assessment criteria when we are done with the lectures today. I'm quite passionate about health and social care. And uh, feel free, should you have any questions to ask, you can either raise your hand by clicking on the thumbs up, or you could alert me or interject me, feel free, and I'm going to stop to explain a bit more. All right, thank you. So in today's lectures, um, we would look at the leading change in health and social care. And as I've mentioned, to understand the perspectives of quality in health care and social care services. We would we need to look into the basic technologies in health care. Safety, we have to look at the basic perspectives of quality in health and social care. We may have safety, effectiveness, and person-centeredness, timelines, and equity, and efficiency. Understanding the perspectives of quality in health and social care services. So let's look at the key determining for the perspectives. We may have the health service staff perspective, which seeks to look into the performances of quality of day-to-day -day quality of work. Uh, this perspective involves social safety, effectiveness, and the overall quality of care they provide in the daily tax. Then we could look at the patient perspectives and how patients see things. And then we could also look into the stakeholder perspectives. Stakeholder perspectives, which involves including regulators and policy makers.
we have academic perspective from academic standpoint how quality of health and social care are subject to study it involves examining differing perspective evaluating healthcare policies and in uk varsity we may offer courses related to this field contributing to the understanding of quality in healthcare Then we have the overall framework. Overall framework. The a comprehensive perspective of where you look at the factors collectively defined quality of care provider. And in conclusion, we could say that understanding quality in health, social care services involves considering the multiple perspectives of patients, staff, and stakeholders and academic community. This perspective collectively shape and the standards and practices that ensure high quality healthcare delivery. And can we sort of look into a bit more the care users perspective that involves continuing continuous quality improvement and patient in safety for everyday use. Then we can look into the new knowledge new knowledge and we could look into other sectors and then also the user requirements the user requirements relative to that the user requirements are changing and becoming greater that perspectives of quality of change, care change the availability of modern information that enables information for users. So these are things that we need to look into. And the modern ways, the modern ways of doing things, the experts receive such healthcare with minimum risk and maximum benefits. The care users do not get satisfaction by only solving a health problem. They expect and demand a pleasant experience. This includes ambience, kindly staff, information about the health and, and also the user wants to take part in decision making. So these are all the carer's views. But then how do we focus on the user and patient? Protection provided tailored towards the specific needs of the patient involved and this is what we call person-centered care. You need to plan, analyze and implement of treatment. Safety, this implies a health system in which patient safety primarily and potentially hazard during diagnostic and therapeutic procedures and the efficacy. Let's look into the, the care that is provided. It should meet the patient appropriately. The unnecessary therapeutic interventions achieve the desired health outcome. Timeliness, healthcare provided within the need is recognized. And the fairness, we need to look into the fairness. There's equal access to services for all users regardless of gender, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic characteristics, and place of residence. Then we have care managers' views. Improving the care quality system is a demanding process. It involves teamwork with defined responsibilities, measuring the care processes and results. It also involves applying best practices and identifying and learning from them. Moreover, into that system, rational use of health, better patient information. The perspectives of quality of care from point of view of care provider is complex. So in effect, what this seeks to expand on 
is that the introduction of safety systems help to have a better safety network for patients and healthcare workers as well in general. And this is how carers view these things. Should we have a bit of video to So we Play this video and then we take it from there.
So having having watched this, you would agree with me. The Kaiser Permanent Connect experience spoke about equity and other interventions that you would need to see from the perspective of carers. And then we would have to look into the stakeholder rules in relation to quality and standards in health and social care settings. Whilst in healthcare settings, various stakeholders play a critical role in upholding and enhancing quality and standards. The term stakeholder refers to any individual group or organization that have interest in health and social care. We look at patients and service users users. So the role they play is that the primary consumers of healthcare and social care services responsibility to provide accurate information and feedback on service received, which helps organizations make data-driven decisions for quality improvement. Then we have healthcare professionals. This could be doctors, nurses, social workers, and all that. And they are responsible to deliver services according to the organization or the hospital guidelines, clinical governance, and the best practices that the organizations have put in around and the values of the organizations. And we need to look at regulatory bodies. This could be the, the midwifery council, the, the medical councils, CQC, and all that. And organized like in the UK, they inspect and regulate and license healthcare and social care providers, thereby setting and monitoring quality standards. For the government and policy makers, this could be oversee policy, this could be the Department of Health, and they are responsible for allocating resources, formulate regulations and enlarge laws to create a framework for delivery And then five, you have non-governmental organizations, and this is what we call NGOs. They offer specialized services and advocacy. Responsibility is to fill gaps in services and raise awareness about healthcare standards and quality, often serving vulnerable pollutions, populations. So they, they help governmental organizations to sort of advocates quite normal and to fill in gaps in services and raise awareness about healthcare standards and quality, often serving vulnerable population, pop, populations. And then we have the taxpayers. These are insurance companies and other funding bodies. Payers. They ensure that healthcare and social care services are cost effective and align with quality standards. Um, Is that sin? Have you just joined? Hello? Aman? So we would have to proceed on to, let's look into the academic and research institutions. So there's a need for a regular academic restructuring or reviews within the perspectives of healthcare. And what they do is that they conduct research and offer trainings when need be. And they are responsible to provide evidence-based recommendations. And in so doing, they could train a generation of healthcare professionals to meet this research or the funding that has been found out that may create a bit of awareness within the healthcare sector. And we could look into community and family immediate support network for patients, so community networks, and they advocate for quality care and provide emotional and logistic support to patients and service users. And then also, we could look into a bit more interconnected roles. And these roles that require collaborative efforts to maintain and improve quality and standards. For example, regulatory bodies may work with academic institutions to update the guidance, which is true. So, an academic institution might find out certain sh shortfalls 
within a particular framework or within a particular provisions. And a regulatory body could pick up these findings and work collaboratively with this academic institution to ensure that these things can be put into practice. So it happened most times within healthcare. So stakeholder engagement is a key component in healthcare. It brings about collaboration and it brings about unique perspective and role contributing to our growth. So what this seeks to do is that it, 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 it boils down into enhancing the organizational visions and missions and add productivity, productivity and organizational goals. Once there will be enough collaboration and enough sharing of or networking, it would help the organization goes are met at a speedly amount or speedily Toba, have you just joined? Yes, sir, and yes. Okay, and can you hear me, please? Yes, sir, I can hear you. All right, then, that's fine. Should you have any question at all along the line, you could let me know. And if I have to recap as well, I will do that, okay? So I just started hearing it. I'd let you know if I have questions regarding this. That's fine. That's fine. We'd also have to look at external agencies and what they seek to do. You know, external agencies do. We can categorize them under regulatory bodies and accreditation bodies. So much as in the UK, a key regulatory body or organization is what we call the Care Quality Commission or CQC. And basically what the CQC does is that even though they are external organizations, they are not within or they are not internal organizations, they play a very crucial role in the provision of healthcare. Uh, without CQC, having to inspect either a hospital or a care home or a supported living facility, you cannot operate. So you need to have per requirement, a registered manager who should have at least a level five health and social care qualification. And the CQC would have to ensure that you have those things in place. You have the requisite staffs who have at least a level three qualification, you have a level five holder who is a registered manager who have successfully been cleared on the DBS. So you need to be have all those things. So the CQC, they regulate, they inspect, and then they give ratings. And having checked all those things, then they'll have to give ratings to, to say that you have passed, the care home have passed this, and you can practice. So that's what the CQC, CQC does. And we say they are external agencies, but they seek to ensure that internal companies or agencies meet governmental policies. Then we also look into the accreditation bodies. Example we can talk about is the Gen Commission International. What they seek to do is to evaluate healthcare organizations against a set of global benchmarks like fostering accreditation to healthcare organizations that meet or exceed international standards, thereby promoting quality assurance. So they just seek to ensure that organizations have a well-structured quality assurance in place in that the service that they are giving out meets international standards. That is what they do. So CQC plays a major role and same with Joint Commission International. Then we need have to look into a bit more professional associations. And one practical example is the critical British Medical Association, the BMA, or the Royal College of Nursing. And these are organizations that seek to protect the interest of professions. The Royal College of Nursing comes out with a bit academia researches concerning nurses and healthcare professionals. And you can also register with them to get protected should you have any issues. So they act more of like a union 
that anybody can join. They represent the interests of healthcare professionals. And as a healthcare, you may always have issues relative to safeguarding. You could be reported for any safeguarding issue or you could be reported for any allegations and there's a need for you to join a, need, a union that will protect you when you have issues so they can advocate for you. They can play the intermediary role as lawyers or they can employ the services of lawyers or legal team to protect you. And they also have so, so they advocate for policy that advance the quality of healthcare and delivery. Then we have the public health agencies. And the Public Health England is the mother organization for any public health agencies. And all they seek to do is to protect and improve public health. And it functions by conducting research and provide education to ensure that those best practices are, meet, are met. Then we need to look into governmental departments. And a key crucial department is the Department of Health and Social Care in the UK. And all they seek to do is to come up with healthcare policies and frameworks, the responsibility to ensure that all frameworks and policies are drafted from them. So they, they, formulate, they formulate policies, allocate resources. When we say resources, they look at government funding, they look into the government funding that should go to various departments within the NHS, or you have to go to the clinical commission within the local level. So this, this department ensure that ensure that this thing so these are the things that seek to ensure things are met and then we have to look into the age uk but these are non-governmental organizations or the mind in the uk they play major roles in healthcare formulations and policies, but they are not government. They focus on specific healthcare needs and issues. So all they do is to help in research and raising awareness against abuse or equality, which helps shape the healthcare frameworks or the healthcare sector. Then research and academic institutions, the Medical Research Council, they conduct research that informs healthcare policies and practice. So what they do, they do regular research, which could be adapted by uh, the NHS England or Public Health England in making sure that policies and guidance are met and reviewed every now and then. Then we can talk about the inter-agency collaborations. In many cases, these external agencies work in collaboration with each other. For example, research institutions may partner with regulatory bodies to update guidance based on new findings. Yes, I mentioned that before, that there's a need for collaboration. And what it seeks to do is that regulatory bodies could sort of partner with academic institutions based on the findings that they have made. So if an institution makes a funding in terms of um, how to overcome the recent abuse against um, certain group of people. The Department of Health and Social Care will have to look into the health and safety part of it and how to collaborate with them to achieve that particular goal. So Care Quality Commission, the Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency, the Public Health England, and the National Institute of Care and Social Excellence. They all play major roles in shaping the standard of healthcare. Tomba, do you have any question to ask? No, sir. All right. Then we have to look into the impact of poor quality and standard on health and social care. In healthcare, quality assurance play a major role, and every care that is delivered should be top priority because um, the healthcare of or the well-being of patients and users are a critical part of healthcare delivery. And so patient and service users need to be taken care of. And there are impacts that can we can look into, into different dimensions. 
One of these is the clinical outcomes. Increased mobility and mortality. Medical errors. In inadequate protocols that can result in misdiagnosis, wrong me medication, or incorrect treatment causing harm to patients. You know, so clinical outcomes are key. And medical errors, not properly listening to instructions and causing harm to patients can lead to legal actions and you can be banned from practicing as a nurse or as a support worker. Financial consequences, in inefficient utilization of resources like manpower and medical equipment can financially drain. So poor quality are often result in readmissions and addi addition treatments, additional treatments. Escalating healthcare costs for both individuals and systems. So these things can drain because the more we have readmissions and the more we have escalating healthcare costs, it helps or it, it brings about a bit more financial costs within the healthcare. Can you hear me? Then we have psychological effects. Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay. So you have loss of trust and emotional distress. As a result that um, service users or patients may lose confidence in the, in the provision of care a, a company is providing. And this may lead them to be non-compliant or non-responsive, not responsive towards the care that is given to us. And this is one of the components of poor quality of care that is given. And if the patient decides to take this on or report, this can lead to prosecution and withdrawal of the care services that need to be given. Then we have the legal and ethical implications. I did mention that anything that is not properly done in healthcare, it could lead to legal actions. Healthcare providers may face lawsuits of more practice. The nurses, if it's a nurse, he could be banned from practicing. If a support worker, he could be banned by the regulatory body, which is the DBS for that matter in the UK. Then we have the system effects, reputation damage. Of course, once there's poor quality of healthcare provided, it, it creates a bit of dent towards the company, reputational. It, it damages the reputation of the organization, you know? And so if you're a carer who does something wrong, it's a first know you the care about the organization that sent you there, you know, and the consistent failures in maintaining quality can lead to more stringent regulations, making it challenging for healthcare providers to operate, of course, because they are always with you anytime there are issues of abuse or issues of neglect or issues of more practices. It's it's it leads to reviewing of healthcare provisions. And so things become more tougher. These toughen things, and that would affect healthcare providers in their discharge or in their contract, or even healthcare providers how to comply with basic regulatory functions and uh, provisions. Then the social impact, inequality, poor quality, and standard often affect vulnerable populations. You know, so inequality. We all know inequality. There, there's, there's no equity. So staff that can lead also broader impl implications for public health, including the spread of infection diseases. So these things are key because once there's substandard care, it can always look the implication for public health. So not only does it limit itself for the care, but it, it, it becomes more broader. 
you know, it's, it becomes a general thing for the public. Once there's a, a key issue within healthcare for a particular organization, it needs to have a holistic review of what it seeks to, including the spread of infection diseases. You know, so if you don't do or handle or provide the care according to COSH or policies or health and safety policies, you may end up creating problem. And if it's infectious diseases, it can spread all over the nation. So poor quality and some health and wide ranging implications affecting patient outcomes and other factors. We'd also have to look into or analyze the methods for evaluating health and social care quality service information. Um, the quality of service provision of social care settings is critical component that is regular intervention. One of it will be the clinical audits. There should be regular clinical audits that is normally done within hospitals or healthcare. And what we call clinical managers. So there's a clinical manager that seeks to have a sense of direction where people will follow for clinical audits every now and then. And that helps a review against any explicit criteria. It also identifies gaps and opportunities for improvement. So if nurses lack certain uh, trainings, the clinical audit will reveal those trainings and it will be um, created or it will be looked into for those nurses to have those trainings. However, its limitation may be, it may be time consuming. It may be time consuming, but it involves a lot of leadership and a lot of time to do that. Then we can also look into the patient satisf satisfaction surveys. Once there are regular surveys that allows patients to give feedback or families to give feedback or questionnaires that we make accessible for patients to give feedbacks, it, it provides direct feedback from service users. However, its limitation may be, it may be subjected to maybe not accurately reflect the quality of clinical care. So much as it has an advantage that you get feedbacks that will help you to review, it may have a limitations or a demise where it may not necessarily reflect the quality of clinical care that was given. So these are key things that you need to look into. And also page performance indicators. Measures like readmission rates, rating times, and infection rates. So you'd always have a data as to how many people called within a hospital within a time, the waiting times and infection rates. Hospitals always have those data. Or care plan will always have, or care companies will have data for that. And advantage is that it's objective and easy to track over time. But it may not cover all aspects of quality of care, such as patient experience. So watch as these indicators are very important it may not cover the patient experience entirely because it is more to do with what has been gotten internally but does not reflect the patient experiences. We could also look at the peer reviews. Those are reviews from other colleagues. When we say peer, peer reviews, we're looking at reviews from your co-colleagues at work. That helps also to enhance patient care. It provides expert insight into clinical practice. However, because it's a colleague, it might be biased. If you have a colleague who don't like you, they could come out with reviews that may not favor you, and that is not a comprehensive view. It might be very biased. And we have to look into also the accreditation and certification. I did mention about accreditations and certifications as well earlier, where I mentioned about CQC and other organizations. So these are external evaluation by accreditation bodies, often involving side visits and in interventions. So CQC is one of them. So they validate quality measures and can be, can be a mark of excellence. So CQC, what they do is that having assessed your company or the hospital, they then give you a rating, whether you, you fall under excellence or where you fall below excellence. So you can either be a good care home or a, an excellent care home or a beyond standard care home, but it might be very cost effective. And then we need to look into 
for health and safety management, we have to look into the incident reporting. Incident reporting, we know about COSH and RIDO, reporting of incidences, regulation of reporting of incidences. So description is that systemic reporting of, of adverse events or near misses. And when you say near misses, anything that was meant to cause accident that did not happen, you nearly miss it. Those are near misses, you know? So harm, and that is likely to cause some uh, accidents, you know? So advantages is that it helps in identifying systemic issues and prevent future errors. Often it's underutilized due to fear of blame because you have to report incidents against your colleague. A lot more people are afraid to do that because you, fingers will point ag against you as the one who had done that. And therefore people have much fear in doing that. Comparative studies, comparing performance metrics with others. The advantage is that it offers a relative measure of quality. But limitations that the difference in patient demographics and services offered can affect comparativity. Of course, patients may have different demographics, different environments and services, and therefore you cannot really tell or ensure that what you are giving out is the same everywhere. Then we have qualitative interviews, in-depth interview with patients and families and healthcare providers to explore experiences and perceptions. The advantage is that it provides rich context data. It is also time consuming. So we have to look into the World Health Organization's framework, the NHS England Evaluation Framework, and the Care Quality Commission analysis. These three methods contribute to the comprehensive evaluation of health and social care quality, ensuring that services, services meet the highest standards and continuously improving to benefit patients and service users. Very key, very key. Everything that this seeks to do is to ensure that patients benefit and health being our top priority. Very, very important. They must be on top priority. So the health care, the Care Quality Commission seeks to ensure that patients are well protected. And they also ensure that the companies that seeks to provide care have what it takes, being cleared of all safeguarding policies. You need to have all the policies available all the safeguarding policies from health and safety policy that we have read about health and safety 1974, from COSH, control of substances as adults, from reporting of incidences, from moving and handling regulations, confidentiality policies, all those things need to be in place. CQC would have to ensure that you have these things in place before they would and give you a clearance to practice as a care home, either a supported living facility or an NHS hospital, where the World Health Organization seeks to regulate countries and nations. And the World Health Organization seeks to ensure that countries comply with the World, World Health Framework guidelines in terms of your nation or your country's way of, of doing things, you have to provide healthcare to meet the World Health Organization framework. And the NHS England evaluation framework has to do with, in the UK, how the NHS should handle its healthcare provisions in tangent with the framework that the NHS England has given. So this would help entirely or contribute to ensure that comprehensive evaluation of health and social care quality, ensuring that services meet the highest standards and continuously improve to benefit service users. And to get a bit more knowledge, there are quite a number of references that you can tap into or learn from. You have the state of healthcare and adult social care in England, 
Care Quality Commission, the Code of Practice on the Prevention and Control of Infections, evaluation, evaluating the quality of healthcare, how monitor inspect standard and guidelines for quality of care. So these are references and books that you can rely on. There's quite a number of them in your model. So preliminary, one of the key things you have to look into is to refer to the ebooks and journals on the model for this unit. Make sure you have further reading. And any concerns that you have, you have to email us so we can look into it and reply. But having said that, let's look at the assessments. Um, Toma, if you want me to recap anything before you joined, I can gladly do so. Okay. No, sir. It's okay, everyone. Now, if we look at for a minute, the the specifications here. So we expect you, Tomba, we expect you in the assessment criteria for learning outcome. We expect you to to be able to explain the stakeholder roles to quality and standards in health and social care settings. Okay, sir. We expect you to be able to explore the role of external agencies in setting and maintaining standards. And then 1.3, okay. we expect you to be able to evaluate the impact of poor quality, as I mentioned, and standards on health and social care. And sure. then the last bit is that she'll be able to analyze methods for evaluating health and social care quality of service provision. These are the four areas that you need to uh, have your assessment on. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Do we have any question at all? No, sir. It's clear. So let me go back to one minute. So explain the stakeholder rules. I I started that before you joined. Mm, you can explain that now then, the things okay. that you started before I joined. Okay, so the stakeholder rules, I did mention that we have two key, one minute. Uh, let me go back to this so that you can see. So if you go, the stakeholder, the, the key stakeholders when it comes to health and social care. So we're talking about the commission, the customers, the patients, the government agencies, your even your competitors, they are all stakeholders. You understand me? They are all stakeholders. However, I did mention, which I'm going the stakeholders view is the Care Quality Commission. Let me play, are you there? Let me play this video. Yes, sir, I'm here. Let me play this video. Yes, sir. At least. Please listen to this video.
ثم ثم Tomba, are you there, please? Tomba, can you hear me? Hello. Hi, Daniel. I think that she got disconnected. I will just try connecting with her, okay? Okay, okay, that's fine. Aman. Can you hear me? Aman. Yes, please. I'm saying we almost done. I was here during a recap. So as okay, she joined, okay. as she joined now. I I've tried connecting to her, but I couldn't. But don't worry, if, I can end the session. If the recording now. is, I was just uh, doing a recap. Yes, yes, yes. If recording is done, it's fine. Yes, you're done with the done. lecture. Exactly, exactly. Since oh. she's she's not in, there's no need then because I was just doing a recap because she joined very late. Okay, no worries, Daniel. All right, all right. Thanks so much, Amma. No. All right, then. let me stop this. All right, see you, Amon, then next week. See you, Daniel. You have lecture. Nice one. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.